I have lived in Harlem for the past 40 years. And I've worked as a pastor in Harlem for the past 40 years. I have baptized over a thousand members of the Harlem community. And I've served over one million plus meals to members of the Harlem community. I've educated hundreds of children in a uh, middle school, um, elementary school, high school status. I've even educated some leaders in the Outlaw Theological Seminary that's presently uh, being revamped. And I wake up in Harlem to the sounds of the sirens and the, the sounds of, 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 of an urban, if you will, ghetto. And I've been doing so, my wife and I, for the past, if you will, 35 years. I, um, and I've been the pastor of the same church, the longest job I've ever had. I've been called because of my godly beliefs uh, about righteousness, the power of God, and truth. I've been called an Uncle Tom. I've been called a hater. I've been called one that hates black folk. And parenthetically, I like to say there, how is it that anyone that hates black people as, as your brother, how can you live around them for, for 40 years and intermingle with them, sit down and break bread with them, play chess with them, give them haircuts, provide housing for them and their children and education? How can anyone who, who does those things consistently for 40 years be a hater of his brother? It's impossible. But I've been called a hater. I've been called a porch monkey. I've been called a coon. I've been, I've been said to ride the coon train, that Manning's on the coon train. But I remember coming to Harlem. My grandmother, Mama Neal, brought me here. My first excursion from North Carolina to New York. I returned and came back two years later. She was living in Brooklyn. In Harlem, as far as I, uh, and I'm pretty articulate at this, I've, I've been educated in Harlem. I attended the Union Theological Seminary where I got my Master's of Divinity degree, which is in Harlem. As I now sit and as the crow flies, Columbia University is only seven blocks from where I sit as the crow flies. I've been educated in Harlem. I've worshiped here. Um, but I remember fondly the Harlem before Dr. King and the Harlem before, certainly before Barack Hussein Obama. I, rem I remember the Harlem where men were men, where men dressed in appropriate apparel that represented their sense of the American business model. And what is acceptable in both white collar and blue collar job circumstances. That the men of the community, uh, that you would see them on the street and because of their recognized dress and the women as well, there was no need to fear. In fact, it was amazing to watch them so well clad. This is the Harlem before Dr. King. This is the Harlem before Obama. Rice High School, which is just less than a block from where I sit now, one of the prominent high schools where many scouts came year after year to look for the future basketball players for the Boston Celtics or for the L.A. Lakers or the Milwaukee Bucks or for the Baltimore. And, you know, all, all those teams, Rice High School. And the students of Rice High School, the young men there were well clad. They were all in uniform and orderly. And, and in fact, uh, right outside our church at, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you couldn't get down the avenue. There'd be so many well-clad school sweaters, blue sweaters and gray slacks and black shoes, young men, well-kempt haircuts, well speaking well and carrying books. You couldn't get down the street for so many young men that were part of Rice High School that is now closed down and defunct. 
many years because what has happened since Dr. King and since Obama. I can show you Harlem now, across the street where the young the men used to sit well dressed with their children. Look at what it looks like now. If you if you what the young men look like. This is Harlem today. This is Harlem since Obama. This is Harlem since Dr. King. This is the Harlem that we live in now. This is what it has come to. This is the brokenness of it. And the irony of all of this is that Harlem is still a mega, mega ghetto for homeless, for broken people, for people that are living on the streets, even though it, there is a mix of several million dollar brownstones right around the corner from where these people now find themselves. I have a question I'd like to ask you, and I pray that you'll take the time to listen. You know, a, a lot of the media, the institutions, the politicians, and others have put together this facade to hate America. Hate America and pay restitution to black people for the atrocities. But years ago, this multi-billion dollar co uh, community was owned by black people. They didn't need no restoration. But there's been a campaign afoot, and it has destroyed. The Harlem before Dr. King and America and his prisons before Dr. King, and I stand corrected, but I think my numbers are pretty close. There were less than 200,000 uh, men in prison uh, that were Hamite men in prison, whether Alcatraz State, a federal prison, or Rawway, Attica State prisons in, in New York and across America. Less than 200,000 men in prison, even down there in Los Angeles, I mean, Los Angeles and Louisiana, at that awful godforsaken place there, or in Rayford, Florida. Less than 200,000 up to 1970. Less than 200,000 people and men in prison. Where were they? Their fathers were in the homes. They were on the jobs. They were in the military. They were in college. After Dr. King and after the civil rights legislation, the number of men in prison now, has, of Hamite men, has risen to 2 million. In fact, the prison... Uh, industry became a cottage industry where America couldn't build prisons fast enough to house all the Hamite. Now you call them black or Negro because there were so many going to prison so quick they had to keep building it. They got the newest prisons you ever want to see here in America and America has more people in prison than any of than Russia, than India, than China. America has more people in prison than any of the any other nation on the planet. And the reason why is because they got all these black men, these Hamites in prison. But before Dr. King and before Obama, America didn't need the prisons that she has now. So what has happened? Why is this so? Why is this so? But I think that what's important for us to understand is this, is that I'm stating that the methods and the leaders, the so-called leading Negroes or the politicians, whether it be that Sylvester boy down in Houston or that woman at mayor down in, in, in uh, Atlanta or the woman uh, mayor out yonder in, in San Francisco or Chicago or the so-called black mayors of Richmond, Baltimore, and all over with all of this black politician. Now, they're Hamites, but all these black politicians, why do we have so many people in prison? Why is it that life is worse now? Why is Harlem a squalor with all these mayors and politicians and senators and congresspersons and even an alleged black president? Why? Why? What's going wrong? Why is this so? Well, the answer is very simple. The answer is extremely simple. There, and there are people that, there, that, that profit from putting the Hamite brother in prison. Let me do a bit of an equation, and I promise not to inflict myself upon you any further. Between 1965 
in the year 2020. We're talking about 55 years. And the number of men that have died in prison or shot down in the street by each other or that have been warehoused or that have become junkies and even today are on some sort of program because they are on, if you will, a, a, a drug substance or they're unemployable. Um, the, the, the manpower that is lost because of the teachings of the such as, as Dr. King or the black ideology about black politicians vote black and get power, or all the other NAACP or Urban League or core organizations, all those organizations that have flourished in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the urban communities, in the mayor like Tom Brad, all those urban have turned the manpower of the black man, they have weakened him they have castrated him and put him in prison. If you could get the number of men totaling more than 10 million men over a period of 55 years that have gone to prison, many have died there, and once coming out, died after prison and did not make a significant contribution, didn't wear nice hats and shoes and didn't have an apartment to take care and come home to their children. The, the, the 10 million men manpower that has been lost. The economics of what those 10 million men, had they not subscribed to the philosophy of the NAACP, of Dr. King, of Obama, or, or the way up is to get a black man as mayor, or a black woman as some sort of leader, or black this, or black university, or black professor, or get a black face on a news program, or get a black movie, that mentality has ripped the black people of 10 million men and the economic contribution over a period of 55 years, which has brought abject poverty and pimp galore to those in politics who keep feeding this monster system that feeds our young men into the prison system, into the homeless shelter system, and into lunacy or death in the street by the time they're 17 year old shot by a 15 year old in Chicago or any place else in the ghetto. And because I'm against that, because I'm against that, I'm a a coon, I'm a porch monkey, I'm a hater, because I lift my voice high and wide against that. That's what they call me. And they've got the media with them. They've got the Japheth, that's the white institution that support their, their, uh, their genocide. And they've all ganged up on me. And not only that, but in the hearts and minds of the Hamites that are going to prison or that are prostrating themselves now and turning over their rear ends to become vaginas for whoever wants it. Uh, and they're, uh, they're embracing these debaucheries of, of social norms. They are, they're, they're being swept up into an, a, a, a program that the universe cries out at night. When, when you look up at the stars at night, and you look at night and darkness, which means separate and, and a positive and negative. I want you to remember this when it comes to the LGBTQ. That every star you see in the universe at night is crying out, don't do this LGBTQ thing so wickedly. It's against the basic principle of the universe, of light and dark, of positive and negative. You cannot have a homosexual universe. Every star is screaming at night. You can't have a homosexual universe. If so, the universe will die. But they call me a hater. They call me a hater, a coon, the man who didn't run away from his brother when he saw him in the street, the man who offered him to come into his house and to sleep and to eat till he can get himself on his feet again. The man who tells the brother, brother, you got to do right. You got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You got to do that which God says in his holy word. They call that a hater. And they tell your brother, brother, don't, don't let another man, don't, don't fellatio another man. Don't, don't do that, brother. 
Don't you do that. God didn't make you to do that. God didn't make you to do that. That's not what your mouth is made for, brother. They call that hate. And they call me a hater. But I'm here. I appeal for your support. We're going to see Harlem live again. We're going to see the prisons emptied out again. I appeal for your support. And perhaps you were one of those that, uh, that thought it was appropriate to hate me because the rhetoric coming from all of the echo chambers of black, if you will, lifestyle or Negro lifestyle or, if you will, African-American lifestyle from Jesse Jackson to Obama, all that coming from the echo chambers and constantly feeding you with the very medicine that is making you weaker, dying earlier, less economically structured, homeless, it's what it brought you. Homeless is what the NAACP, homeless is what the black mayors have brought you. Homelessness, poverty, sickness, it's what has it brought you. And, and perhaps you won't take a second look at that. And you won't take a sec second look at me. I'll be here. I'll be here. And, and don't be, when you finally realize I have been telling the truth and there's no brother like me. When you finally realize I've been telling the truth, there's no brother like me. Come on home to Atla. The door is open and I'll be waiting. I'm James David Manning, everybody. I'm the Lord servant. This is a bit of a news blog we do looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon, uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly sinful view. But the man will tell you what God has said, whether to say yea or nay, whether to go or to stay. You'll be led by the word of Almighty God. Come to the Manning Report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he, I'm the Lord, sir, James David Righteous Rebel Manning. And I'm here to serve you with news and information.